Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Uh, as you know from the video title or the thumbnail, this video is about mess management in the workshop. It's inevitable while doing woodwork in a shop that some of the dust is going to escape no matter how careful I am to collect it as it's being made. Some operations, like at the bench, I don't even try to collect it, I just let it fall and then clean it up. But the two main things I use to control dust in the Next Level Carpentry shop are the Gyro Air G700 dust processor, and I'll talk about that a little later in the video, and I use a dust scoop. I've had one like this for about 14 years. It's a great scoop. This is uh, originally made by the Leitner Brush Company. I think they sold out to somebody and somebody uh, else, and right now, near as I can tell, a company called Sequent is the one that sells this. I really like the scoop. It's handy, useful, and durable. Uh, my old one, which you'll see in a bit, held up to all those years in the shop and all kinds of abuse, it's still going strong. But I'm looking forward to uh, upgrading to a new one after this video is made. I'll include a link in the video description for this dust scoop if anybody's interested. But those are the two things I use for dust management. But I'm not doing this whole video just to tell you that. Part of the reason is I wanna announce a special promotion uh, by Harvey Industries for the Gyro Air G700 dust processor. For anybody that's been thinking about that, I'll talk about that at the end of the video. And the other reason is, while this is a really good dust scoop, I've got an upgrade for it that makes it a really great dust scoop. And that's the purpose of the video. I wanna show you that upgrade to help you with mess management in your shop. I'll show you what I'm talking about. It probably shows that doing video intros and outros kinda of make me nervous and only calm down after I start doing the actual work. And to start the actual work, I'll spin the table saw out of the way and do a demonstration of how this dust scoop works. And I got my trusty bucket of sawdust just for this. Right out of the package, the scoop has a, a nice comfortable handle on it. And to use it, just scoop up whatever's on the floor that needs to be cleaned up. The way the lip of the pan is formed, it flexes and follows the contour of the floor and does a pretty respectable job of cleaning up this fine dust just with a quick swipe. And that right there is why I call this a good dust scoop. It's a lot handier than a regular dust pan and I don't necessarily need to sweep uh, the dust into it every time because I can just swipe. But what keeps this from being a great dust scoop is the fact that I've got to bend over to use it. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, the more time I spend in the shop, the less excited I am about having to bend over to scoop up dust at the end of the day. And that's why I decided to upgrade this good dust scoop to make it great. And to do that, I just custom made a longer handle. So the function of the scoop is the same, but I don't have to bend over. And I call that a great dust scoop. So I'm gonna show you how I made this handle so that if you need a great dust scoop for your shop, you can make one. And good thing I don't rely on my salesmanship to make a living. But like always, I wanna start with a clean shop before I make a new mess. The process I use for making complex curved shapes like this is to first make a template out of uh, quarter inch material. I like this melamine faced MDF and believe that the process is just faster than taking this three quarter inch Russian birch, cutting the shape and then doing all the contouring and sanding on the finished part. It's much easier to make a template. This is the one that I made uh, in July of 2005 for this handle. And, uh, it's, like I said, it's made out of a quarter inch melamine faced material and it's real easy to contour and shape this to get it right. If I need to make an adjustment, it's easier to make a second template than it is to make a second part. But rather than just use this template to make a new handle, I wanna show you how to make a template like this so you can uh, tweak it to your preferences, maybe making the handle longer or shorter, that sort of thing. This is the same uh, process I use for making my uh, custom push sticks. And there's a video link here, a card, that you can check out to see the uh, details of making a template in this shape. And I went pretty far into the weeds making the templates for these push sticks. Uh, there's a few different co um, configurations, etc. So if you want more information about the template making process, check out that other video 
uh, and you can get some more details in case I skip over some of the finer points here today. And to start the uh, layout or design or planning process for this, I have to keep in mind I want the dust scoop to have the same function um, in the long handle and the short handle version. So I, I want the dust scoop to be on the floor and I want the handle to be in the same orientation, just higher up. And for this, I've made that scoop about 18 inches to the gripping surface here. I could see easily making that 24 inches for a tall person or if you've got a back that's stiffer than mine. And I just want to raise the handle up in the same orientation as this. I don't want to put the handle up here and make it more like a bucket and I don't want it down here like a shovel because then I'm still bending. So I've just kind of brought this orientation up and back and the front of the handle right here it's about 11 inches back from the back of the scoop. I went through some more trial and error when I made this original handle and those dimensions there's nothing magic about that. You can customize that to your preference but I'm just going to use those two references uh, 18 inches up and 11 inches back to show how I guide this shape. So I've got a nice clean piece of uh, quarter inch melamine stuff here and uh, I want to make the pattern out of that but because of this angled layout and the way the pattern's oriented on the sheet with if I use this as horizontal and this as vertical I don't want to just chop off the whole corner of this piece to make this template because I can make it uh, out of a thin slice off the edge. So I chose to overlay the melamine with a piece of rosin paper for the initial layout I'll actually make a pattern for the pattern for the piece this way and that's just a method that you can employ for this pattern making process uh, if it makes more sense. If you've got no end of quarter inch melamine to use just make the pattern directly on the piece and don't worry about these extra steps. This plastic handle held to the dust scoop with a little screw in the back so I want to take that off. Oh and note that there's a D-ring on here and I want to incorporate that into the new handle. To get the orientation of the handle right, I want the bottom of the scoop to line up with the floor. So just use this edge of the pattern to represent the floor and then trace the outline of the back of the scoop on this paper. And that way I can orient the handle to fit the back of that scoop. Like this is the, how the initial installation is. And the little notch for the D-ring is back here. And the measurements we used for reference were 11 inches back from the back of the scoop here and 18 inches up. And that was to the front of this in, inside of this handle and the top of the inside of the handle. Now I'm going to show you how to make this cool finger grip feature on here. It's kind of like a pistol grip. And I'll show you how to make that in this process as well. And I want the handle to be in the same orientation as it is down here with the scoop sitting on the floor. So I just slide this up like this until the handle lines up with the top line and that line. It's nowhere near as complicated as I'm making it sound. And I'm tracing out this shape up here. And I'll put the whole outside of the handle on, but not all of it gets used. Like that. So now we have the elevated handle position over here. And we have the shape of the handle where it fits the dust scoop down here. I just need to connect these two pieces now. And the fact that I could just use a straight piece of wood like this and connect those two without any fuss doesn't escape me but hey this is next level carpentry and because it's relatively easy to make a nice graceful curve between the two with this pattern process that's what I'm going to do. So I like the curve on the back of the handle and I like the curve on the back of this handle. So I'm just going to freehand sketch a curve between the two. Kind of meld those curves together. I'm using my elbow as a pivot point here sort of. And I'll just sketch this in until I got a curve that I'm kind of happy with. My old jumbo shop eraser uh, is dwindling so I got a new one here that I'm going to try out for this video. I got these two just to find out if one is better than the other and what I find is that these jumbo erasers have a different consistency than pink pearls which are my favorite. Pink pearls are great but they're just kind of small and they wear out too fast but the bigger ones tend to be kind of gooey. The composition of these big erasers uh, seems to be different for some reason. They just seem kind of gooey and sometimes 
they don't erase very well. Uh, so I'm evaluating these two. I'll put links to them if anybody needs one because they make as many mistakes as I do. But the big eraser helps to guide this line. as I fare the two curves to get a shape that I am happy with. That doesn't seem to be too bad. Let's see how I did with the original one. Yeah, looks like I put a little more curve into it this time. And that's kind of cool, so I'm going to leave it. I need to maintain part of this initial original handle here. So I'll kind of retrace, make sure I'm happy with that. And then set about blending the two of these together. This curve can sweep in a little more, taking out this little nib of that original handle. Make this, and I want to make this arm, I don't know, inch and three quarters or so wide. And I think I'm going to flatten that curve out just a little bit. Change the sweep of this a little bit here. Tighten up that radius a little. This is when I feel most like Bob Ross doing this sort of thing. And you can see that the shape of this handle is noticeably different than the one I made 14 years ago. But I'm just going to try this style out and see if I like it better. And the lesson here is that as long as the relationship of the two ends is in place, the middle can be anything. Go ahead, get wild and crazy, and shape it any way you like. I like the curve of this outside a little better, so I'm going to erase the inside. And then gauge this out. Set about an inch and three quarters is what I've got. That's plenty. And I just connect the dashes and get a somewhat concentric curve. That's looking a little fat, so I'm going to bring this side in. Take it down to an inch and a half. So far, I'm liking the Oops Eraser better than the Four Big Mistakes Eraser. So I'll recommend that one at this point. And I hope it's easy to see how this um, process is flexible. I'd be doing the same layout if I was working with the final material, the three quarter inch Russian birch. But by doing it on paper first and transferring the melamine and then doing the birch, I've got a lot of flexibility. You can see where this handle could be placed anywhere for a more comfortable position. The shaft in, in between could do all sorts of things, or it could be just straight, any of those things. But by starting on paper with this simple process, I can dial that in before committing to the actual material. When I did the push stick video, a viewer, uh, and I apologize, I don't remember your name, uh, it might have been Tom, took the photo I put into Pinterest of the push stick template and then converted it into a DXF file so people could use it for CNC routing and that sort of thing. So Tom, if that was you or whoever it was, I'll include a grid layout of both of these handles and put the photo on Pinterest. And if you or anyone cares to convert it to a DXF and share it with the audience, that'd be wonderful. Otherwise, anybody can go to Pinterest and get a grid layout of these two handles if you have an interest in replicating either of these instead of starting from scratch on your own. The next step in the process is going back to kindergarten because I'll just cut this paper template out with a pair of scissors. Now that I've got this template, I can trace it on the melamine for the same result and a little less waste of material. And taping it down will help with the process. And then I can just trace this out with a Paper Mate Sharp Writer pencil. The only real critical part of this whole template is shaping the contour of the curve where it contacts the dust scoop right in through here and then gets that little D knot or that little notch for the D handle here. I told you I was going to go through the steps for making this comfortable pistol grip handle and it's a lot easier than it looks. By using a little outside the box thinking, I've uh, by trial and error found that an inch and a quarter Forstner bit fits right in here nicely. So the way I go about this is to just line up the drill bit on these contours 
and give the bit a little tap when I like what I've got. Inch and three quarters, three quarters, so I want 13 sixteenths, 13 sixteenths, 13 sixteenths, 13 sixteenths. And those four hole centers will make this contour in the pattern quickly and easily. And now I can just six and a half inches off the end of this piece and follow the contour on a bandsaw. And it's a bit ironic that I'm making dust on the floor while making a handle for the dust scoop without using the dust collector. And I have the luxury of using a Laguna bandsaw for cutting out the pattern and the handle shape, but you can do it just as well with a jigsaw with this pattern making process and still come out with a perfect result. And if there was ever justification for the statement that the lazy man works the hardest, it's right here and right now. I was too lazy to put in a quarter inch blade into the bandsaw. And as you can see, the half inch blade is too wide to follow these closed curves. I'm gonna leave this in the video so you can see the efficiency of this pattern making process, even with less than ideal cutting. So if you end up doing yours with a jigsaw and it gets a little out of control like mine did, you'll see how easy it is to fix. And notice how much extra material I leave on the outside of the line on the outside of the handle curve. I'll show you why I did that in just a minute. To cut out the pistol grip part of the handle in the pattern. Hard to imagine it being any easier than that. Now I can easily mark out the bottom part of the handle and cut that with a coping saw or a jigsaw. Obviously this could be done with a scroll saw too and I have one but here again, the lazy man is working harder because I don't feel like digging that scroll saw out. And it's a little embarrassing that a $150 jigsaw with the right blade can do a better job than a $2,500 bandsaw with the wrong blade. And the thing that takes the most time by far in whipping up a template like this is shooting video of it. This process I can easily do in 20 minutes, come up with a perfect template, but with the video, I'll, I'll spend an hour and a half at it. But uh, once you get used to the thought process for creating different shapes and the templating process. I think you'll be able to adapt it to all manner of things. Like I said, I use it for push sticks, other fixtures around the shop, and um, it works pretty slick. And the next, the next step is to uh, fare the curves on the inside and the outside of this handle. And I'll clamp this in a vise to get that done. For fearing a long curve like this, I've just got this curved scrap of wood, nothing special about it. There's a little flex in it and uh, 36 grit sandpaper is plenty uh, smooth for doing this template work. But I can quickly true up this curve, get it close to my uh, pencil mark and make sure I like the way it feels. And at this stage, I let the look of the template and the feel of it supersede the pencil mark. The pencil mark was just a sketch guideline to get me in the right space. But fairing the curve like this is uh, what I want for the final result. And I think you can see along the curve. It's nice and smooth. There's no flat spots or humps in there. So this side is nice and true and is the reason why I left more material on the other side. So I can just erase that pencil mark and then trace this one so that the two curves are concentric. So if I follow that pencil mark, I have a nice consistent width of the curving handle. So it's back to the bandsaw to trim a little bit closer to that pencil line, but still proud of it before smoothing it up with the sandpaper. And now I can use the opposite side of my stick to clean up this side. And I think I'll buy that. And I use an assortment of other PVC pipes and things to shape the rest of the curves. And I'll throw in this little pro tip. Uh, a pipe is great for um, shaping things, but it's a little hard to hold the sandpaper on there sometimes. But if you make a slit in there with a bandsaw or a hacksaw, you can slip the paper in and give you a nice hold on it for shaping stuff. And this should be nice for this little curve section here. A 
smaller pipe is a better fit right here. And this is a place you want to be careful because it's easy to dip down below a long line like this and make a bump right at the end. So I'm a little extra careful at those transition points so I don't spoil my pattern. This is really simple to match up a pipe diameter with the desired curve. And end up with any shape you want. And the hardest thing here, again, is staying out of the view of the camera so you can see what I'm trying to show. I got a little deep with this saw cut, but I think I can average it out. But I can't quite get it, so I'll go to plan B and use a little bit of a Starbond activator and Starbond thick CA glue. And in just a short time I can infill that little boo-boo and still have a perfect pattern to work with. I'll wait till, wait till that sets up good and dry before I tackle it and finish up the inside curves first. Then I switch to a flat sanding block for the outside curves. And I like this little style block here. It's easy to handle and maneuver on tight curves like this. And you can see I'm just cleaning up right into about where that pencil line is, but letting the actual contour override the pencil if that's what it takes to make it a fair curve that's smooth. I'm going to use a file on that infill just because it's a little more controllable on material that's as hard as that CA glue compared to this MDF. And if somebody has a preference, you can certainly use a file on more of this. I just like the sandpaper because it's fast and tends to average out the curves a little quicker. I'm sure the question is going to come up. Why don't I use a spindle sander? The reason is because this is so fast without it, I can get it done. If you have a spindle sander, by all means use it. But I don't have that piece of equipment in my shop because all these curves I make smooth and accurate quickly on this quarter inch material and make the workpiece using a flush trim router bit. And I think overall it's much better and more accurate. And because the fit of this curve to the dustpan itself is so critical, I'll take both over to the table saw, then line up the pan with the fence and retrace the curve for a perfect fit before I finish sanding it to the final shape. And it won't take much to get that perfect fit. And after a few licks with the right size sanding block, I got that shape just where I want it to be with a perfect fit to the dust scoop. This sharp end of my pattern is degrading, so I'll strengthen it with a little bit of CA magic. Activator first, thin CA second. It permeates the MDF fibers. And soon this end of the template is more durable than the rest of the template. And I can round it off slightly for the final piece. One little touch on this detail here, and I think I'm going to be happy. And I almost forgot to true up the inside of the bottom of this handle. But with a few licks, I can get a smooth transition between the drilled holes and the jigsawed curve. Well, I hope I didn't bore you too much uh, with the process of making this pattern, but I think you'll agree that this is a pretty complex shape uh, to be made and duplicated in a shop uh, with a CNC, this would be a piece of cake. And maybe some of you will do that with a DXF file if one shows up. Uh, but once I'm at this stage, this is ready to transfer to the three quarter inch Russian birch to make the handle. After tuning up that last little uh, curve detail, the new handle is done. 
can get a pretty good idea how similar the two handles are. Looking at this, I think the shape of the dust scoop is just slightly different and the handles maybe three eighths of an inch off from where it was, but uh, very similar for all intents and purposes. Uh, for the new handle, I've got this piece of uh, three quarter inch Russian birch that'll work great for the handle. This is uh, about seven by 40 and I only need uh, six by 25 or so to get this done, but just take the new pattern and lay it here on this piece and then I just tack the pattern to the piece. I'm going to avoid this little football here so it doesn't end up in this new handle. And I'll tack it down using number 18 by 5 8 inch nails and this handy little tack hammer. And I'll just get one nail on either end of the pattern. to uh, keep it stable. I guess this has got a bit of flex in it. I'll put a third nail in the middle here so it doesn't flex during the routing process. Once that's tacked down where I want it, I just take a sharp writer pencil and trace it out. And once again, I'll mark the handle center holes with this inch and a quarter bit. But I'll drill them out with an inch and an eighth bit so that the router ends up flush trimming the inside of the handle to the pattern. If I try to drill this with the inch and a quarter and something's off a sixteenth or a thirty-second of an inch, uh, I won't like the end result. Since I don't want to risk nicking the pattern when I cut this out with a bandsaw, I just take a putty knife and slide it between the pattern and the wood. and give it a twist to pop it off and I'll back these nails out. And it was far too embarrassing cutting out that pattern with a half inch blade in the bandsaw. So with the camera off I switched out the blade to a nice uh, sharp new Sterrett quarter inch blade which will be able to follow these curves nicely. And a sharp new blade is so much nicer and more professional to work with. Well, you gotta love technology. Uh, the camera quit right as I started cutting this and I didn't know that so I cut the whole piece out without getting uh, the video shot. But the bottom line is, or the important part is, that I've cut, leaving about a sixteenth of an inch proud of the line all the way around. Um, and that gives me a margin to route off with the router. And as I'm cutting, I just remember, as long as I don't go through the pencil mark, it's gonna be good. If I dip into that pencil mark, that spoils the final piece. So it's better off leaving just a little bit extra than taking too much, but a sixteenth of an inch is a great margin for this process. Here I've switched to a one and an eighth inch drill bit using the same centers as the one and a quarter inch drill bit holes and that will give me that routing margin between the piece and the template. Geez, if I had a dust scoop I could clean up my mess. Well I might have to take this camera out behind the woodshed because I used the jigsaw to cut out this little piece of the handle and the camera wasn't running so you don't get to see that. If my table saw behaved like that camera it'd be at the landfill by now. Um, now that the pattern is trimmed, or the workpiece is trimmed, I'll just set the pattern back in place, line up the pencil marks, and redrive the nails to hold the pattern on the workpiece. I've got a half inch cut, half inch shank, three fluted bottom bearing flush trim bit in my router table router, and I'll use that to trim the workpiece flush to the pattern. This is an old router, the bearings are getting bad, but it'll still get the job done. And I like to wear these uh, blue Smurf gloves when I'm working with uh, patterns like this because it gives me a firm grip on the piece and I can keep my fingers away from the router bit without having things jump around and get out of control if I lose grip on the piece. And that is why I love this template process. My workpiece is now complete. As far as shape, I'm not spindle sanding for hours or half an hours. And uh, I could make 10 of these handles and they'd be identical 
whereas sanding would leave variation in the piece, which eh, I'd rather not have. With a thin putty knife, I just pop the pattern off the workpiece again. Then I can drive out and pull these template nails before they poke a hole in me somewhere and cause me to leak blood. So this is the handle pattern. I'll lay it out on a one inch grid and take a photograph of it so that anybody can uh, use the Pinterest thing and trace it out if you want to duplicate this handle. And uh, earlier I talked about a DXF file. I think the same gentleman, and in actuality, I think the gentleman I referred to made a printable PDF, which would be really nice. You could just um, run it off a printer and lay out a couple sheets of eight and a half by 11 and get this exact template shape. So um, hopefully I've not offended that particular uh, helpful viewer and those PDF uh, printouts will materialize. But for now, I'm gonna do one more thing to this to class it up a little bit. And I'll do that by putting a thumbnail profile all around these surfaces, except for where it meets the back of the dust scoop. And I use a piece of the cutoff scrap to set the depth of the thumbnail until I'm happy with it before I go on to the actual workpiece. And a couple of minor adjustments take me right where I want to be. There's a nice smooth transition between the two curves without a lip in the middle or a flat spot. And you can see with a quick lap around each face of this, got a thumbnail profile the whole way around. And if I can get the camera to focus, you can see the detail on the handle. It makes for a nice comfortable grip, but a sturdy grip because of the extra contour. And then that even thumbnail profile follows all the way around the handle, just like it was manufactured instead of whipped up in an afternoon in the shop. This plastic handle has a couple of little lugs on here that slip into these funny shaped notches on the top of the dust scoop. To hold that handle on, and then it only takes one screw in the back to keep those lugs engaged. Um, lugs like that on a wooden handle just wouldn't be any good. So I've got to locate the hole for this screw and then add one more screw with a fender washer on here to hold the handle to the scoop. So I use the Sharpie to lay out a center mark on the back of this handle and I'll mark the screw hole through that. The important thing is to get a good snug fit between the dust scoop and the handle back here. Kind of pushing this into place and then I'll mark the screw hole from the inside like that. And the screw will pull it just nice and tight where it needs to be. And since I'm screwing into wood and not dense plastic, I'm going to use a screw that's a little bigger and a little longer to hold the scoop to the handle. And I like the looks of that one. I drill an appropriate sized pilot hole so it doesn't split that plywood. And then I'll pre-drive the screw to give it a path for the final installation. That's pulled up nice and tight and snug. And then I'm just taking a stub of pencil to mark out the location of that cutout into the top of the scoop. This way I know where to drill the hole for the screw that'll hold the fender washer here. And I'm back to the screw sorter to dig through my selection of number 14 pan screws. And I'll find a stubby one for this application. Think you need one of those? Yep, you do. And from my selection of special washers, I've got a fat fender washer there that's gonna work great. And I'll drill an appropriate pilot hole right there. And I'll pre-drive this screw too. Something like that. And now I can do a final test fit installation of the scoop to the handle. 
made easy by those pre-drilled holes. And I'll use this general precision offset ratcheting screwdriver with a stubby Phillips bit in there to drive that number 14 pan head screw into its home place. Like that. And there's what the finished product looks like. A no stoop dust scoop for mess management in the workshop. I think these are close cousins here for appearance and function. But this one's a lot more stable. This one's gotten a little bit wallered out over all the years. Still functional, but I'll send that one to a new home. For now, I'm going to take the handle off again, sand it, and spray a couple coats of pre-catalyzed lacquer on there to get that glassy smooth finish for the feel I want of the finished product. Another great feature of using the template process for making parts with complex curves like this is that once the piece is done, the work is pretty much done. It just takes a light lick of sanding on the flat and curved surfaces and it's all ready for the finish of your choice. And I find that quite preferable when compared to using a spindle sander and grinding things to shape. And viewers that know how much I dislike sanding know that I'd use this template process even if it was a lot more work if it meant that in the end there was less sanding. But even I can't complain with the little amount of sanding that it takes to get such a wonderful finished product. And I think I'll brand this with today's date just because I can. I'll always remember how I should have spaced those letters out just a little differently. A number of viewers have been asking questions about my finishing process, and one of these days I'll get around to that. But I couldn't justify it at the end of this video because I need to get it produced and uploaded. But suffice it to say, I use a gravity feed cup gun and Sherwin-Williams pre-catalyzed lacquer and apply two coats to projects like this to get a fast, excellent, durable finish. And this is a tricky part to finish regardless of the process and in my opinion kind of requires a black belt in spraying to get it right without a bunch of drips and runs. Once the lacquer finish dried on the handle uh, I put it back on the dust scoop and that pretty much completes the upgrade from the original handle to this no stoop dust scoop handle. And I hope some viewers will uh, tackle this project and if you're part of a group or a club or if you hang out with friends that would work uh, remember, it only takes one pattern and you can make dozens of identical handles. So a little bit goes a long way. I'll guarantee you this is the cleanest uh, this dust scoop will ever be. Um, it will be put to use immediately in the shop. Something I didn't mention about this particular dust scoop design with that flexing bottom. This scoops up liquids. I've spilled finishes on the floor and um, this will really uh, pick up a lot of that. So there, there's more benefit to it than just the dust aspect. Uh, another little thing I like to do is put a chunk of rare earth magnet. I just stick that in the back of the scoop. And there's a lot of times there'll be some small parts or screws that end up stuck to that magnet when I'm cleaning up and I can uh, rescue them and not wonder whatever happened to them. And look at the shavings collected on that magnet. I've been doing some metalwork projects in the shop for organizing. That thing looks like a porcupine. And if you decide to tackle the project and need the dustpan or any of the other tools and products you saw in the video, there's a link to an Amazon influencers page in the video description. Everything you get there is the same low online cost to you, uh, but Amazon pays next level carpentry and ad fee, which helps support video production here. And I really appreciate it. So click a link, support the channel. Thank you. In the beginning of the video, I mentioned my number one dust collection method, which is this uh, Gyro Air G700 dust processor by Harvey Industries. And they're doing a show in California, the West Tech show. And as a promotional price for the show, they've reduced the cost of this machine by 425 bucks in conjunction with the show. And that sale is good through September 29th of 2019. And that sale price is for the 2019 model. Uh, this is a 2018 model. 
Uh, the 2019 has the remote control built in and it has HEPA filters. This one I had to add the remote and these are just the 5 micron filters, not the actual HEPA. So it's a better machine than this and it's a great sale price. So take advantage of that if you've been thinking about it and go through the nextlevelcarpentry.shop email to get in touch with me and I can give you details for getting that sale price. The flat rate shipping anywhere in the lower 48 is 149 bucks, which is pretty decent for a machine that weighs 500 pounds. I've done uh, three other videos featuring this dust processor. You can click the links up here and uh, show the unboxing, see how to um, clean out the dust bins, and see a little bit about the flexible hose setup that I've got here in the shop, which makes the shop versatile because I'm not tied into a rigid duct collection system. So check it out. Contact me if you need more information. I'd help you out any way I can. I've got a scrolling list here of all the Next Level Carpentry patrons on Patreon, and I hope you guys know how much I appreciate the fact that you've uh, found content uh, value here enough to go above and beyond and support the channel through those pledges. With the income structure from YouTube, Patreon is a pretty key part in uh, sustainability for Next Level Carpentry. So I appreciate each and every one of you, uh, plus the dialogue uh, that we have ongoing. Because of the key part that Patreon's beginning to play, I'm making an effort to upload exclusive content there uh, with a little behind the scenes things from projects in the shop and to add a little extra value for those who are able to participate in that program. If anybody's interested in Next Level swag, like this t-shirt, or uh, that goofy poster back there, um, just click the Teespring link in the video description, check out any of that swag, uh, sales there, help support the channel, and offset the reduced revenue that YouTube is paying content producers these days. That's just the reality of being in business online. So you can have a little bit of fun with some swag, and I really appreciate it. If you uh, like this video and this process, uh, please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, You'll be notified when new videos come out here at Next Level Carpentry and poke the thumbs up button if you would to let YouTube know there's stuff going on here. I appreciate all that viewer interaction. Welcome to the channel or thanks for hanging out with the channel depending if you're a new or an old subscriber. You can tell I'm uh, nervous here in standing in front of the uh, camera mode for the outro of the video so I better cut this off uh, before I dig myself in a bigger hole and say as always, thanks for watching. I guess that's a wrap.